Hello everyone, it is Christy. Welcome to the book club on the social construction of reality. In the last video, we looked at section one of part one, having to do with the person and mind and experience of the reality of everyday life. In this section, the authors are looking at the interactions, um, the conditions of interactions between two people. And this sets us up really for the next chapter, which is the most important chapter in this section, in my opinion, on language. It's the most complicated and the most detailed. Um, sadly, the authors don't signpost this <laughs> as well as I wish they would. I really wish they would sort of say, in this chapter, in this section, we're going to lay out these things and then I'm going to draw these conclusions. Um, but as it is, you sort of have to like figure out what they're saying as in the course of the chapter and then maybe go back and think about it a bit more deeply. Uh, but anyway, I've got my notes here. I will take pictures of these and I will submit them uh, to the Discord group. And I also am going to try to figure out a way uh, to do the book club discussion. Uh, last week I, I got a migraine, which really knocked me for six for about 48 hours. And then this week I've been on holiday. Um, it's been crappy weather. You don't care about this. I'll move on. But basically, I'm hoping to organize something in the next week. So let's look quickly at uh, section 2.1, social interactions. Let me pull up my copy on my Kindle. All right, so the notes that I have about the social interaction aspects of the reality of everyday life, I'm going to tell you what I'm pulling out of the chapter as being most important. So in terms of this, what they say is that the reality of everyday life is shared with others and that the most important elements of that shared experience uh, are the face-to-face are the -face ones. The face-to-face -face are the most sort of real experience of an interaction with someone else in terms of our shared reality of everyday life and all others are derivatives of this. So what they also say is that um, our here and now, if you remember from last time, it's continuous and fully real and that others subjectivity in a face-to-face -face discussion is maximally available but still subject to misinterpretation. They also go on what I have noted here in my notes, this weird tangent about my past and better knowledge and not immediately apprehended. Okay, I don't know if this is the best place to deal with these concepts, but they put them in there. And then they talk about face-to-face -face situations being highly flexible. What I found interesting in here was their use of the term typificatory schemes. Am I saying that right? Yes, I think so. <laughs> and I actually made a note, I had to go look up typificatory, if I'm saying that correctly, to understand sociologically what they meant. And what I found is that typification is the process of relying on general knowledge as a way of constructing ideas about people and the social world. As we participate in social life, most of what we know of other people does not take the form of direct personal knowledge, but rather general knowledge about the social world. If I meet somebody and they say they're English, I mean, there is a wide range of um, locations, personalities, you know, individuals that could be uh, within the geography of English. But to my mind, you know, I have a, a, a typology or a typification, I guess, of what I would expect an English man or person or non-binary person to be like in terms of their preferences. You know, I, I will predict that they will um, drink a lot of tea and that they may watch uh, a lot of football. Um, they might call things pubs and bins and dustmen and, you know, use that kind of language. Um, and, it, and that might not map onto anyone in particular. I don't have to have personal direct knowledge of every single person who resides in England um, to have general knowledge about the world. So typifications become more anonymous the further they are from a face-to-face -face situation. Again, I can have a generic idea of an English woman in my head, but if I meet a woman from England, that might not withstand the personal interactions. There are also, there are directness and indirectness, and the degree of intimacy with the other person, not just the frequency. Another element that I pulled out from this chapter is that the social reality of everyday life is apprehended in a continuum of typifications, with one pole of inner circle and at the other hand, 
highly autonomous abstractions. So again, this is relating to the ways in which our understanding of the world is built on more generic terms, or is it confronted with or interacting with real human beings that, that uh, you know, aren't boxed in by typification if you deal with them on a face-to-face -face basis. And then one of the last things I have here is that social structure is the sum total of these typifications and of the re recurrent patterns of interactions established by means of them. And that's potentially a pretty, pretty bold statement to, to unpack. Social structure is the sum total of all of these typifications. And I'm not challenging this uh, on its face, but it is a rather bold claim in terms of how we construct social structures. I mean, they're saying all social structures are based on these types of things. I'm also now, I have my Kindle here, so I am going, uh, trying to find, the, I should put the page numbers, although it's not really page numbers, it's just sections on here. And yeah, so actually in my book, I have, um, I've got a color coding scheme, which you won't be able to see. Uh, yellow, which is like generic stuff. Uh, blue, which I think is more important. Can I put this up here? No, you're not getting any of that. Um, and then pink is like the stuff that I think is especially important. Uh, but yes, to say that one last time, social structure is the sum total of these typifications and the recurrent patterns of interactions established by means of them. As such, social structure is an essential element of the reality of everyday life. Uh, I think if we wanted to talk about this chapter or this section in the group, that might be a good, um, if we ever do the group discussion, that might be a good one to pull out and, and really expand on and get people's thoughts. All right, I really only have a couple more notes on this section. Quick, quick video. Um, can also relate to predecessors and successors. So these typifications can go into our past uh, memories or just conceptions of the past as well as the future. My immigrant parents, my, the founding fathers, my children's children, they mention. And they say that these typifications are substantively empty projections, which I think is quite a good insight uh, and also maybe something we can discuss in the group. But they say... Um, my successors, for under understandable reasons, are typified in an even more anonym anonymous manner. My children's children or future generations. These typifications are substantively empty projections, almost completely devoid of individualized content. And this is why they're saying there's no real people that you know from your grandparents, you know, your immigrant grandparents who are all great grandparents, or your children's children. You can't know them. They're just empty concepts. They're placeholders. They're not based on individuals that you've actually experienced. Whereas the typifications of the predecessors have at least some content, albeit of a highly mythical sort. A highly mythical sort. Now, uh, the last line of this is also, I think, worthy of looking at. The, the anonymity of both of these sets of typifications, however, does not prevent them entering as elements into the reality of everyday life, sometimes in very decisive ways. After all, I may sacrifice my life in loyalty to the Founding Fathers, or, for that matter, on behalf of future generations." Uh, so this is also, even though they're giving more interactive weight, substantively, to face-to-face -to -face, um, you know, interactions, than these sort of uh, empty signifiers, these placeholders for concepts that aren't filled with real individuals, perhaps yet, or you know, they were at one time, but now they're dead. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it can't be a call to motivation or fundamentally change my life or impact uh, the course of my life, these ideas. All right, that's, that's pretty much chapter two as far as I can see. As I said, the next one, language and knowledge in everyday life, is far more substantive than the first two chapters that we've looked at so far. And sadly, it is not signposted as well as the other ones are. So you're, you might have to read it. Like I tend to read these chapters three times. The first time to, uh, I think to try to absorb the information. The second time to try to figure out what's the important stuff to take away. And then, uh, thirdly, to uh, figure out what I'm going to talk about in the video. 
So uh, I did think about doing the language one with this one, but once I started actually going through and reading it, I was like, no, 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 no. This, this totally needs its own time and space. So I think maybe what would be helpful is um, I will try to organize either through Discord or here on YouTube a video time or, yeah, uh, try to organize a video conferencing time so that everyone who wants to can jump in and ask some questions or talk about their impressions or link this to other things that they might also be thinking about to make it more real for you. Until next time, guys, I have been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for your time and attention, and I'll look for you in the section one, chapter three, part of the social construction of reality.